The Discourses of Epictetus Translated by George Long Book 1 Chapter 20 About Reason, How It Contemplates Itself Every art and faculty contemplates certain things especially. When then it is itself of the same kind with the objects which it contemplates, it must of necessity contemplate itself also, but when it is of an unlike kind, it cannot contemplate itself. For instance, the shoemaker's art is employed on skins, but itself is entirely distinct from the material of skins, for this reason it does not contemplate itself. Again, the grammarian's art is employed about articulate speech, is then the art also articulate speech? By no means. For this reason it is not able to contemplate itself. Now reason, for what purpose has it been given by nature? For the right use of appearances. What, what is it then itself? A system, combination, of certain appearances. So by its nature it has the faculty of contemplating itself also. Again, sound sense, for the contemplation of what things does it belong to us. Good and evil, and things which are neither. What is it then itself? Good. And want of sense, what is it? Evil. Do you see, then, that good sense necessarily contemplates both itself and the opposite? For this reason it is the chief and the first work of a philosopher to examine appearances, and to distinguish them, and to admit none without examination. You see, even in the matter of coin, in which our interest appears to be somewhat concerned, how we have invented an art, and how many means the assayer uses to try the value of coin, the sight, the touch, the smell, and lastly the hearing. He throws the coin, denarius, down, and observes the sound, and he is not content with its sounding once, but through his great attention he becomes a musician. In like manner, where we think that to be mistaken and not to be mistaken make a great difference, there we apply great attention to discovering the things which can deceive. But in the matter of our miserable ruling faculty, yawning and sleeping, we carelessly admit every appearance, for the harm is not noticed. When then you would know how careless you are with respect to good and evil, and how active with respect to things which are indifferent, neither good nor evil, observe how you feel with respect to being deprived of the sight of the eyes, and how with respect to being deceived. And you will discover that you are far from feeling as you ought to do in relation to good and evil. But this is a matter which requires much preparation and much labor and study. Well, then do you expect to acquire the greatest of arts with small labor? And yet the chief doctrine of philosophers is very brief. If you would know, read Zeno's writings and you will see. For how few words it requires to say that man's end, or object, is to follow the gods, and that the nature of good is a proper use of appearances. But if you say what is God, what is appearance, and what is particular and what is universal nature, then indeed many words are necessary. If then Epicurus should come and say that the good must be in the body, in this case also many words become necessary. And we must be taught what is the leading principle in us, and the fundamental, and the substantial, and as it is not probable that the good of a snail is in the shell, is it probable that the good of a man is in the body? But you yourself, Epicurus, possess something better than this. What is that in you which deliberates? What is that which examines everything? What is that which forms a judgment about the body itself, that it is the principal part? And why do you light your lamp and labor for us, and write so many books? Is it that we may not be ignorant of the truth, who we are, and what we are with respect to you? 
Thus the discussion requires many words. Book 1 Chapter 21 Against Those Who Wish to Be Admired When a man holds his proper station in life, he does not gape after things beyond it. Man, what do you wish to happen to you? I am satisfied if I desire and avoid conformably to nature, if I employ movements towards and from an object as I am by nature formed to do, and purpose and design and assent. Why then do you strut before us as if you had swallowed a spit? My wish has always been that those who meet me should admire me, and those who follow me should exclaim, O oh, the great philosopher. Dot. Who are they by whom you wish to be admired? Are they not those of whom you are used to say that they are mad? Well, then do you wish to be admired by madmen? Book 1 Chapter 22 On Precognitions Precognitions are common to all men, and precognition is not contradictory to precognition. For who of us does not assume that good is useful and eligible, and in all circumstances that we ought to follow and pursue it? And who of us does not assume that justice is beautiful and becoming? When then does the contradiction arise? It arises in the adaptation of the precognitions to the particular cases. When one man says, he has done well, he is a brave man, and another says, not so, but he has acted foolishly, then the disputes arise among men. This is the dispute among the Jews and the Syrians and the Egyptians and the Romans, not whether holiness should be preferred to all things and in all cases should be pursued but whether it is holy to eat pig's flesh or not holy. You will find this dispute also between Agamemnon and Achilles, for call them forth. What do you say, Agamemnon? Ought not that to be done which is proper and right? Certainly. Well, what do you say, Achilles? Do you not admit that what is good ought to be done? I do most certainly. Adapt your precognitions then to the present matter. Here the dispute begins. Agamemnon says, I ought not to give up Chryses to her father. Achilles says, You ought. It is certain that one of the two makes a wrong adaptation of the precognition of ought or duty. Further, Agamemnon says, Then if I ought to restore Chryses, it is fit that I take his prize from some of you. Achilles replies, Would you then take her whom I love? Yes, her whom you love. Must I then be the only man who goes without a prize? And must I be the only man who has no prize? Thus the dispute begins. What then is education? Education is the learning how to adapt the natural precognitions to the particular things conformably to nature, and then to distinguish that of things some are in our power, but others are not, in our power our will and all acts which depend on the will. Things not in our power are the body, the parts of the body, possessions, parents, brothers, children, country, and generally all with whom we live in society. In what then should we place the good? To what kind of things, Ugia, shall we adapt it? To the things which are in our power. Is not health then a good thing, and soundness of limb, and life? And are not children and parents and country? Who will tolerate you if you deny this? Let us then transfer the notion of good to these things. Is it possible then, 
when a man sustains damage and does not obtain good things, that he can be happy? It is not possible. And can he maintain towards society a proper behavior? He cannot. For I am naturally formed to look after my own interest. If it is my interest to have an estate in land, it is my interest also to take it from my neighbor. If it is my interest to have a garment, it is my interest also to steal it from the bath. This is the origin of wars, civil commotions, tyrannies, conspiracies. And how shall I be still able to maintain my duty towards Zeus? For if I sustain damage and am unlucky, he takes no care of me, and what is he to me if he cannot help me, and further, what is he to me if he allows me to be in the condition in which I am? I now begin to hate him. Why then do we build temples, why set up statues to Zeus, as well as to evil demons, such as to fever, and how is Zeus the savior, and how the giver of rain, and the giver of fruits? And in truth if we place the nature of good in any such things, all this follows. What should we do then? This is the inquiry of the true philosopher who is in labor. Now I do not see what the good is nor the bad. Am I not mad? Yes. But suppose that I place the good somewhere among the things which depend on the will, all will laugh at me. There will come some gray head wearing many gold rings on his fingers, and he will shake his head and say, Here, my child. It is right that you should philosophize, but you ought to have some brains also, all this that you are doing is silly. You learn the syllogism from philosophers, but you know how to act better than philosophers do. Man, why then do you blame me, if I know? What shall I say to this slave? If I am silent, he will burst. I must speak in this way, excuse me, as you would excuse lovers. I am not my own master, I am mad. Book 1 Chapter 23 Against Epicurus Even Epicurus perceives that we are by nature social but having once placed our good in the husk he is no longer able to say anything else. For on the other hand, he strongly maintains this, that we ought not to admire nor to accept anything which is detached from the nature of good, and he is right in maintaining this. How then are we suspicious, if we have no natural affection, to our children? Why do you advise the wise man not to bring up children? Why are you afraid that he may thus fall into trouble? For does he fall into trouble on account of the mouse which is nurtured in the house? What does he care if a little mouse in the house makes lamentation to him? But Epicurus knows that if once a child is born, it is no longer in our power not to love it nor care about it. For this reason, Epicurus says, that a man who has any sense also does not engage in political matters. For he knows what a man must do who is engaged in such things, for indeed, if you intend to behave among men as you would among a swarm of flies, what hinders you? But Epicurus, who knows this, ventures to say that we should not bring up children. But a sheep does not desert its own offspring, nor yet a wolf, and shall a man desert his child? What do you mean? That we should be as silly as sheep? But not even do they desert their offspring, or as savage as wolves, but not even do wolves desert their young. Well, who would follow your advice, if he saw his child weeping after falling on the ground? For my part one think that even if your mother and your father had been told by an oracle that you would say what you have said, they would not have cast you away. Book 1 Chapter 24 
How we should struggle with circumstances. It is circumstances, difficulties, which show what men are. Therefore when a difficulty falls upon you, remember that God, like a trainer of wrestlers, has matched you with a rough young man. For what purpose, you may say. Why, that you may become an Olympic conqueror, but it is not accomplished without sweat. In my opinion no man has had a more profitable difficulty than you have had if you choose to make use of it as an athlete would deal with a young antagonist. We are now sending a scout to Rome, but no man sends a cowardly scout, who, if he only hears a noise and sees a shadow anywhere, comes running back in terror and reports that the enemy is close at hand. So now if you should come and tell us, fearful is the state of affairs at Rome, terrible is death, terrible is exile, terrible is calumny, terrible is poverty, fly, my friends, the enemy is near, we shall answer, be gone, prophesy for yourself. We have committed only one fault, that we sent such a scout. Diogenes, who was sent as a scout before you, made a different report to us. He says that death is no evil, for neither is it base. He says that fame, reputation, is the noise of madmen. And what has this spy said about pain, about pleasure, and about poverty? He, he says that to be naked is better than any purple robe, and to sleep on the bare ground is the softest bed. And he gives as a proof of each thing that he affirms his own courage, his tranquility, his freedom, and the healthy appearance and compactness of his body. There is no enemy near, he says, all is peace. How so, Diogenes? See, he replies, if I am struck, if I have been wounded, if I have fled from any man. This is what a scout ought to be. But you come to us and tell us one thing after another. Will you not go back, and you will see clearer when you have laid aside fear? What, what then shall I do? What do you do when you leave a ship? Do you take away the helm or the oars? What then do you take away? You take what is your own, your bottle and your wallet, and now if you think of what is your own, you will never claim what belongs to others. The emperor, Domitian, says, lay aside your laticlave. See, I put on the angusticlave. Lay aside this also. See, I have only my toga. Lay aside your toga. See, I am now naked but you still raise my envy. Take then all my poor body, when, at a man's command, I can throw away my poor body, do I still fear him? But a certain person will not leave to me the succession to his estate. What then? Had I forgotten that not one of these things was mine? How then do we call them mine? just as we call the bed in the inn. If then the innkeeper at his death leaves you the beds, all well, but if he leaves them to another, he will have them, and you will seek another bed. If then you shall not find one, you will sleep on the ground, only sleep with a good will and snore, and remember that tragedies have their place among the rich and kings and tyrants, but no poor man fills a part in a tragedy, except as one of the chorus. Kings indeed commence with prosperity, ornament the palace with garlands, then about the third or fourth act they call out, O Scytherin, why didst thou receive me? Slave, where are the crowns, where the diadem? The guards help thee not at all. When then you approach any of these persons, remember this that you are approaching a tragedian, not the actor, but Oedipus himself. But you say, such a man is happy, for he walks about with many, 
and I also place myself with the many and walk about with many. In some remember this, the door is open, be not more timid than little children, but as they say when the thing does not please them. I will play no longer, so do you, when things seem to you of such a kind, say I will no longer play, and be gone, but if you stay, do not complain. Book 1 Chapter 25 On the Same If these things are true, and if we are not silly, and are not acting hypocritically when we say that the good of man is in the will, and the evil too, and that everything else does not concern us, why are we still disturbed, why are we still afraid? The things about which we have been busied are in no man's power, and the things which are in the power of others, we care not for. What kind of trouble have we still? But give me directions. Why should I give you directions? Has not Zeus given you directions? Has he not given to you what is your own, free from hindrance and free from impediment, and what is not your own, subject to hindrance and impediment? What directions then, what kind of orders did you bring when you came from him? Keep by every means what is your own, do not desire what belongs to others. Fidelity, integrity, is your own, virtuous shame is your own, who then can take these things from you? Who else than yourself will hinder you from using them? But how do you act? When you seek what is not your own, you lose that which is your own. Having such promptings and commands from Zeus, what kind do you still ask from me? Am I more powerful than he? Am I more worthy of confidence? But if you observe these, do you want any others besides? Well, but he has not given these orders, you will say. Produce your precognitions, prolepsius, produce the proofs of philosophers, produce what you have often heard, and produce what you have said yourself, produce what you have read, produce what you have meditated on. And you will then see that all these things are from God. How long then is it fit to observe these precepts from God, and not to break up the play? as long as the play is continued with propriety. In the Saturnalia a king is chosen by lot, for it has been the custom, to play at this game. The king commands, do you drink, do you mix the wine, do you sing, do you go, do you come? I obey that the game may not be broken up through me. But if he says, think that you are in evil plight, I answer, I do not think so, and who will compel me to think so? Further, we agreed to play Agamemnon and Achilles. He who is appointed to play Agamemnon says to me, Go to Achilles and tear from him Briseis. I go. He says, Come, and I come. For as we behave in the matter of hypothetical arguments, so ought we to do in life. Suppose it to be night. I suppose that it is night. Well then, is it day? No, for I admitted the hypothesis that it was night. Suppose that you think that it is night? S suppose that I do. But also think that it is night. That is not consistent with the hypothesis. So in this case also, Suppose that you are unfortunate. Well, suppose so. Are you then unhappy? Yes. Well then are you troubled with an unfavorable daemon, fortune? Yes. But think also that you are in misery. This is not consistent with the hypothesis, and another, Zeus, forbids me to think so. How long then must we obey such orders? 
As long as it is profitable, and this means as long as I maintain that which is becoming and consistent. Further, some men are sour and of bad temper, and they say, I cannot sup with this man to be obliged to hear him telling daily how he fought in Mysia, I told you, brother, how I ascended the hill, then I began to be besieged again. But another says, I prefer to get my supper and to hear him talk as much as he likes. And do you compare these estimates, judgments only do nothing in a depressed mood, nor is one afflicted, nor is thinking that you are in misery, for no man compels you to that. Has it smoked in the chamber? If the smoke is moderate, I will stay, if it is excessive, I go out, for you must always remember this and hold it fast, that the door is open. Well, but you say to me, do not live in Nicopolis. I will not live there. Nor in Athens. I will not live in Athens. Nor in Rome. I will not live in Rome. Live in Jairus. I will live in Jairus, but it seems like a great smoke to live in Jairus, and I depart to the place where no man will hinder me from living, for that dwelling place is open to all. And as to the last garment, that is the poor body, no one has any power over me beyond this. This was the reason why Demetrius said to Nero, You threaten me with death, but nature threatens you. If I set my admiration on the poor body, I have given myself up to be a slave, if on my little possessions, I also make myself a slave, for I immediately make it plain with what I may be caught, as if the snake draws in his head, I tell you to strike that part of him which he guards, and do you be assured that whatever part you choose to guard, that part your master will attack. Remembering this whom will you still flatter or fear? But I should like to sit where the senators sit. Do you see that you are putting yourself in straits, you are squeezing yourself, how then shall I see well in any other way in the amphitheater? Man, do not be a spectator at all, and you will not be squeezed. Why, why do you give yourself trouble? Or wait a little, and when the spectacle is over, seat yourself in the place reserved for the senators and sun yourself. For remember this general truth, that it is we who squeeze ourselves, who put ourselves in straits, that is, our opinions squeeze us and put us in straits. For what is it to be reviled? Stand by a stone and revile it, and what will you gain? If then a man listens like a stone, what profit is there to the reviler? But if the reviler has as a stepping stone, or ladder, the weakness of him who is reviled, then he accomplishes something. Strip him. What do you mean by him? Lay hold of his garment, strip it off. I have insulted you. Much good may it do you. This was the practice of Socrates, this was the reason why he always had one face. But we choose to practice and study anything rather than the means by which we shall be unimpeded and free. You say, philosophers talk paradoxes. But are there no paradoxes in the other arts? And what is more paradoxical than to puncture a man's eye in order that he may see? If anyone said this to a man ignorant of the surgical art, would he not ridicule the speaker? Where is the wonder then if in philosophy also many things which are true appear paradoxical to the inexperienced? Book 1 Chapter 26 What is the Law of Life? When a person was reading hypothetical arguments, Epictetus said, This also is a hypothetical law that we must accept what follows from the hypothesis. But much before this law is the law of life, 
that we must act conformably to nature. For if in every matter and circumstance we wish to observe what is natural, it is plain that in everything we ought to make it our aim that neither that which is consequent shall escape us, and that we do not admit the contradictory. First then philosophers exercise us in theory, contemplation of things, which is easier, and then next they lead us to the more difficult things, for in theory, there is nothing which draws us away from following what is taught, but in the matters of life. Many are the things which distract us. He is ridiculous then who says that he wishes to begin with the matters of real life, for it is not easy to begin with the more difficult things, and we ought to employ this fact as an argument to those parents who are vexed at their children learning philosophy, am I doing wrong then, my father, and do I not know what is suitable to me and becoming? If indeed this can neither be learned nor taught, why do you blame me? But if it can be taught, teach me, and if you cannot, allow me to learn from those who say that they know how to teach. For what do you think? Do you suppose that I voluntarily fall into evil and miss the good? I, I hope that it may not be so. What is then the cause of my doing wrong? Ignorance. Do you not choose then that I should get rid of my ignorance? Who was ever taught by anger the art of a pilot or music? Do you think then that by means of your anger I shall learn the art of life? He only is allowed to speak in this way who has shown such an intention. But if a man only intending to make a display at a banquet and to show that he is acquainted with hypothetical arguments reads them and attends the philosophers, what other object has he than that some man of senatory and rank who sits by him may admire? For there, at Rome, are the really great materials, opportunities, and the riches here, at Nicopolis, appear to be trifles there. This is the reason why it is difficult for a man to be master of the appearances, where the things which disturb the judgment are great. I know a certain person who complained, as he embraced the knees of Epaphroditus, that he had only 150 times 10,000 denarii remaining. What then did Epaphroditus do? Did he laugh at him, as we slaves of Epaphroditus did? No, but he cried out with amazement, Poor man, how then did you keep silence, how did you endure it? When Epictetus had reproved, called, the person who was reading the hypothetical arguments, and the teacher who had suggested the reading was laughing at the reader, Epictetus said to the teacher, You are laughing at yourself, you did not prepare the young man nor did you ascertain whether he was able to understand these matters. But perhaps, you are only employing him as a reader. Well then said Epictetus, if a man has not ability enough to understand a complex syllogism, do we trust him in giving praise, do we trust him in giving blame, do we allow that he is able to form a judgment about good or bad? And if such a man blames anyone, does the man care for the blame? And if he praises anyone, is the man elated, when in such small matters as a hypothetical syllogism he who praises cannot see what is consequent on the hypothesis? This then is the beginning of philosophy, a man's perception of the state of his ruling faculty, for when a man knows that it is weak, then he will not employ it on things of the greatest difficulty. But at present, if men cannot swallow even a morsel, they buy whole volumes and attempt to devour them, and this is the reason why they vomit them up or suffer indigestion, and then come gripings, defluxes, and fevers. Such men ought to consider what their ability is. In theory, it is easy to convince an ignorant person, but in the affairs of real life, no one offers himself to be convinced, and we hate the man who has convinced us. But Socrates advised us not to live a life which is not subjected to examination. <laughs>